Welcome to the Business Model Sandbox, where leaders come to transform their business models, not just incremental improvements to the way things work today, but entire new ways to create, deliver, and capture value. I'm Saul Kaplan. I'm the founder and chief catalyst here at BIF. I'm your host in the Business Model Sandbox, and each month I have the good fortune of talking with a leading thinker and doer in the transformation space. No different this month. Uh, pinch me. I'm really excited. You know, with me in the Business Model Sandbox is Rita Gunther McGrath. Uh, I'm going to introduce her here. I'll give you just some of the highlights. It would take the whole half hour. Uh, you know, Rita is really one of my innovation heroes. She truly is world-renowned thought leader on innovation and growth strategy. Uh, you could almost use the word guru, I think, would apply. We don't throw that word around, Rita, very often. Uh, but in your case, uh, I, think it, uh, I think it applies. Rita's a professor at the Columbia Business School. Uh, she's a prolific uh, author. Uh, just a few of the books that she's written here, Discovery Driven Growth, which we're going to talk about, The End of Competitive Advantage, which is a meaty topic, uh, and the, her most recent a book, Seeing Around Corners. Uh, we'll touch uh, on each of these. Uh, Rita has so many accolades and awards. Uh, she's uh, every year one of the top 10 most influential thinkers in the world, uh, rated by Thinkers 50. And if I'm right, Rita, uh, you've been named the number one uh, influential thinker in the strategy domain. That's right. Yes. Imagine that. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to the Business Model Sandbox. Great, uh, a great to have to you. A pleasure to be here. A pleasure to be here. Let's start there. I mean, uh, just I can't even wrap my mind around the the number one uh, influential <laughs> thinker in the strategy world. Uh, uh, how do you react to that? Well, it's obviously very flattering. Um, I think it was a case of the research and the moment coming together at the right time, uh, as so many of these things are. And it really reflects, I think, a recognition among people in the strategy field that the tools and frameworks and ideas that we inherited from a different time may not be applicable to what we're up against today. And in particular, this notion of industry is a central field for investigation and that your position in industry was going to largely explain your performance. Um, tools like the Boston Consulting Group Growth Share Matrix, um, you know, those kind of tools, they're good tools, but they're built for a much more stable time. And so I think what my work does is it embraces the idea that we're now in a more unstable, less certain, more ambiguous uh, time in strategy, and we need different frameworks for looking at that. Yeah, uh, uh, understatement. Uh, <laughs> turbulent uh, times. Let's start. I mean, give me talk to me a little bit about the uh, the uh, the big trend here in terms of how strategy has changed. You know, it seems to me that I mean, even if you just peer into the executive suite in most most large institutions and corporations, first of all, it's gotten a lot more crowded, hasn't it? Uh, <laughs> but there's a whole lot of different people with you know. Uh, you know, chief something uh, in their title, you know, all kind of hanging around in the executive suite. Uh, it's it's it seems a miracle to me that we could ever set a clear strategy that uh, everybody could follow. Is that true? Did well, I think you see different roles um, with different names and roles that used to be in the C-suite now are sometimes transmogrified into something else. And, you know, what's called a chief strategy officer means about a thousand different things, depending on who you talk to. So sometimes it's the person who's in charge of M&A. Sometimes it's the person who's in charge of, you know, very analytical strategies. Um, so it varies a lot in terms of who's in there. I don't know. I don't have any data on the size of executive teams, but it makes sense to me that you'd see much more of a latticed view of uh, how they're behaving. One of the big changes, I think, is that we're going from a world where we used to be able to count on having a sustainable competitive advantage to a world where advantages are much more what I call transient. So you have this period in time in which an advantage is created, you get to exploit it for a while if you're lucky, and then it comes under pressure. You know, technologies change or the competitive field changes or customers decide they want something else and the old advantages go away. So 
A great example of this today is um, conventional retail. You know, I mean, if you think about the business model for your classic American shopping mall, right? It was you had a department store at each end, and you had a long hallway, and you had lots of little stores in between, um, and that was how you serviced your community. Well, department stores are now absolutely reeling from the advent of not just e-commerce, but different business models, which I know is near and dear to your heart, uh, which have instrumented a direct-to-consumer way of competing. And so you've got, uh, you know, shops like um, Warby Parker, you know, in eyeglasses and Casper in mattresses, um, selling direct to consumer, no mall, no department store, no middle person involved. And I think that has proved to be an existential shock to the traditional way of doing business to the point where, you know, we've got malls being abandoned at a dramatic rate. We've got conventional department stores shuttering their branches, uh, companies like Barnes and Noble closing down their big stores in many cases. Um, so, you know, it's really that, that whole wave. You see that in the history of something like a Barnes & Noble. Let's, I mean, I'll bounce around, probably not in the right order uh, across your uh, many books, but since you brought up the, you know, sustainable competitive advantage, uh, you know, this notion, you know, that uh, I think, you know, and this is where I first learned of your work, um, you know, this assertion that, you know, that uh, sustainable competitive advantage is the wrong milestone, uh, and you were trying to put a stake in it, weren't you, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get uh, leaders to think very differently differently uh, about it. So talk a little bit about, you know, if sustainable competitive advantage is dead, if it's not the right uh, milestone, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, uh, why that's true and why is it taking so long for leaders to uh, figure that out? Well, I think the first problem that the whole sustainable competitive advantage uh, mindset is built to grapple with is entry barriers. You know, if you think about when a lot of these frameworks were created, India and China weren't global. You know, we weren't dealing with global competition. Um, the information revolution was in its infancy. So you couldn't just buy computing capacity on the fly. You actually had to buy servers and hire developers and stuff like that. So the, the costs of going into business were much higher. And in many cases, that provided a barrier to entry. Today, you know, two kids in a garage can come up with a business that can challenge you know, um, the Procter & Gamble, you know, think of Dollar Shave Club, for example, as, as an example of these direct to customer things. So I think, um, so, so when I talk to people about it, they all nod and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think, though, that something we don't pay enough attention to is you can run a declining business for a really long time. Um, I was just, in fact, on the phone earlier today with someone who's, who told me that their business has been in declining sales quarter by quarter for an entire decade. And the question is, well, you know, what do you do in that situation? And the reality is that if you don't have sort of entrepreneurial leaders, if you don't have people that say, hey, I really care about this thing being a viable concern for a long, long time, you, you can make a lot of money on a declining business. And so my only record plea there would be, you know, make that explicit. Like, don't don't lure people into thinking this is going to be some kind of growth business when what you're really planning to do is just run off the assets and return the business to the shareholders at the end of um, end of life. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, however, if assuming you want to run your entity for the long term, what I believe needs to happen is you need to take those declining businesses, extract as many of the resources from them as you can, and then use that to fuel the next generation of competitive advantage. So you've got a bit of a virtuous circle going on there where things get invested in early, you learn from them, they eventually mature in a way that informs your core business, and you go from there. So a great example of this is Nike, right? So decades before the direct-to-consumer revolution, Nike was already in 1990 opening up its Nike Town stores. They were doing the Nike Plus iPod. Remember those back in, I think it was 2006. You had to literally plug the thing into your computer because we didn't have, you know, the cloud. Um, and but, but they made all these little small bets, small bets in getting closer to the consumer. Today, their CEO is saying, this is our main competitive thing. It's going to be, it's going to be the basis for our future competitiveness, this direct-to-consumer uh, model. And they've even gone so far as to say, you know, we may have 30,000 retailers that we work with, but there's only going to be 40 that we focus on because an undifferentiated mm -hmm. mid-market retailer has no future. 
Yeah, it seems it, it seems to me that that so many leaders who still behave as if the game is what I call share taking. You know, mm -hmm. you referred to it really beautifully. You know, just if the mindset or construct is industry, this is the industry I compete in. This is who I compete with. This is how I measure my success. I'm a share taker. I protect what I have and I try to build share within a defined uh, marketplace. I mean, uh, we're going to come back to this uh, a little bit later, but that's what I learned when I got my MBA. Right? That's what I learned how to do. You know, that's what I feel like the education, you know, was you know grooming me to do. But not the uh, the other part of that, which is what I call market making, which plays by a completely different set of rules. And it seems to me, tell me whether this is right. It seems to me that the CEO job is harder than it's ever been because you have to do both of those things, and doing them are different. You organize differently, right? You make decisions differently. You allocate resources based on different frameworks if you're share taking versus market making and far too many leaders that i see are still in a share taking world and they believe they can win by out executing the the competition and if if we're right the, the more and more industries, more and more companies are vulnerable, you know, to being completely disrupted. And no share taking the world is gonna is is gonna allow somebody to win that game. I would agree. Yeah, I mean, a great example of this would be uh, General Electric, um, which you know that would be kind of an iconic um, symbol of that. You know, sustainable competitive advantage world. I mean, GE is a brilliant execution machine, right? Uh, and yet back in the sort of 2015 timeframe, they decided to make a huge bet of Alstom's energy business. And essentially what it was, was a doubling down on a commitment to fossil fuels at the exact moment in time when we had the Paris Climate Accords going, we had renewables with you know the investment of police, uh, like the Danish oil company, and uh, Equinor from Norway, really pushing to reduce the price of wind, for example, and other sources of power. And essentially what happened was you can take all the share you want, but if you're in the fossil fuels business, you know, a lot of their direct customers at GE were saying, uh, I'm going to wait. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's, which way the wind's going to blow and I'm not going to make literally, right? <laughs> and I'm not going to make a 25-year commitment to a fossil fuel plant. So I'll just hold off on this. And that's one of the things that's led them to their current crisis. So let's go back to an earlier book here. I think one of the fundamental uh, insights, you know, that you coined this phrase, discovery-driven growth. So I'd like to unbundle that a little bit. You know, uh, what do you mean by discovery-driven growth? And how is that different than the way we thought about growth in that competitive advantage era? Sure. So the, the competitive advantage era was really based on the idea that you had a platform of experience which would allow you to predict what's going to happen. And so if you were doing a business plan, let's say, you would say, okay, here's my 18-month business plan. I'm going to develop this thing in the first six months, then I'm going to launch it to the market, then I'm going to have so many months of sales, blah, 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 um, as though you knew what was going to happen, right? Um, and what we realized, my colleague and I that developed this, is that in a high uncertainty situation, what, what you have to work with is assumptions. You don't have facts. And so the discovery-driven idea was how do you manage with discipline when you realize your main job is to change assumptions into facts and then act accordingly? And any new business uh, you know, has a job of reducing the assumptions it makes and converting them into, into facts as quickly as possible. Now, one of the interesting things that has happened recently in the world of, say, venture capital is we're going through this sort of post-90s, again, <laughs> kind of delusional investing in firms that just have not done the hard work. You know, I mean, it used to be you found a business model and then you scaled that business model. And what some of these firms are doing now is they're just skipping over that first step. <laughs> you know, they're just growing, right? But but we still don't know, right, whether their fundamental business model is viable enough. 
So the, the whole notion of discovery-driven planning basically says break your monolithic planning process down into pieces. And then the question becomes, what is it worth it to us to learn about what we need to at the next piece? So uh, let's say I'm doing something with autonomous vehicles, right? Uh, is it worth it to me to make a $100,000 investment in X to demonstrate the viability of a, an autonomous solution in a particular setting or not? And then you get away from this discussion of failure and being right and all that other stuff. Instead, it's a much more uh, of a mindset that says, I don't know, what's it worth me testing this to go learn? Yeah, so th I think this is so important to the discussion, this idea of predictability, and I can analyze my way to the future. And again, I, you know, it's personal, it goes back to my education, you know, scientist, MBA, you know, we can analyze our way to anything, right? And only to learn that in the transformation space, Right. We can analyze our way to incremental improvements. We can decide uh, which project amongst five different projects are going to give us the most predictable, best return on our investment. But it seemed to me that when, if the goal was really transformation, not just a buzzword, but you really needed to do something wholly different, that you needed a whole different tool set and approach, right, in, in order to do it. And that's incredibly uncomfortable for share takers who want to analyze their way and only be right. We're only going to do the things that we have convinced ourselves we're right about, which doesn't open up that exploration space. It seems to me that transformation is more of a generative act. You have to explore your way there. I've heard you talk about the importance of, of of experimenting all the time, learning, you know, maybe reframing failure as intentional iteration uh, so that we can get to a better answer. All of these things we've been yakking about as consultants and strategists, you know, in the marketplace for a long time, it's, it's a hard win battle. It's hard to win that battle, right? If you could do something predictable, you know, of course you're going to do that predictable thing. And how do we carve out the space, the mind? Mindset, the the space, the the ability to experiment with something when we have no idea, you know, whether it's going to work in advance. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating question, and I think it really comes down to how you manage your portfolio. You know, if you're an organization of any complexity, so you'll have one set of practices and resources that are dedicated to your core business. That's where things are the most predictable. Although I will say, one of the things that's happened in the last probably five, six years, is I'm seeing whole sectors where the core business is now being shoved into the same level of uncertainty that used to be reserved for the innovation businesses, right? So whole companies are looking at their core business and going, oh my God, what do we do here? Uh, so the portfolio model though basically says some things are gonna be core, you invest in those, you have a lot of confidence those are gonna pay off for you. But because it's core, it's been around a while, the possibility of real breakthrough returns is probably pretty low. Then you've got candidates to be your next generation core business, which are things like Amazon Web Services, right? When it was first launched, um, nobody thought that was going to be Amazon's core business. And yet today it produces the lion's share of Amazon's margin, right? But then you've got this investment in what I call options for the future, which are small investments that teach you something. Uh, that don't commit you to taking the next step, but they show you whether you might want to or not. So for Nike, something like the Nike Town started off as an option. It was one store. It was in Portland, Oregon, just outside Portland, Oregon. And, you know, it, it's a rental store. You fill it with your merchandise. You see if that generates a customer response. Now, let's say it didn't. Um, at that point, okay, you go on to the next thing, right? But if it did, then that gives you the option to say, huh, maybe I'll do another store and maybe another. And then that gives you the opportunity to say, we can now test concepts in the stores now that we've got viable stores, which is a very similar strategy to what Apple did. And this was years before Apple opened the first Apple store. So Nike was really onto that very early on. Yes, I mean, the Apple one is the iconic 
uh, example, isn't it? You know, where, where Steve Jobs, you know, was the consummate uh, you know, experimenter of new business models, uh, seemingly regardless of whether it would disrupt the core, right? Which is, uh, and everybody would look to that example and say, yeah, but, you know, Steve Jobs is one in a million. And, and so the question really becomes, how do we help all leaders, right, to do that? How, how do we make the transformation piece safer and easier to manage? And it strikes me that a lot of your thinking and a lot of your work is trying to bring that calm, you know, to a very turbulent uh, environment uh, to the executive suite. Absolutely. And, you know, the good news is that there are a lot of things you can know, even if you can't know everything. There's a lot of things you can know. Um, you can test things quickly with customers. You can be looking at um, you know, in-market experiments. You can you can use um, uh, mock-ups. Um, I think one of the most important things that leaders have to get comfortable with is you really have to get out to what I call the edges of the organization to see where the changes are actually starting to emerge. And, and a lot of times they don't do that. So, you know, my feeling is if you, if you are out at the edges, if you are curious, if you are asking for what's going on, um, it can really teach you how you might want to redirect your offering. So an interesting example of this is Hubert Jolie at Best Buy. You know, 10 years ago, people were ready to give Best Buy up for dead. They said, oh, it's going to be showrooming. People are going to come in and look at, you know, look at the physical product. And then they're going to go off and buy it on the internet for cheap, more cheaply. Um, and what Uber said was, well, okay, if that's going to be the behavior, right? Our customers have jobs to be done. And this is a phrase Clay, Clay, Clayton Christensen uses. Um, and he says, don't think of hiring products. Uh, don't think of buying products and services. Think of hiring them to get jobs done in your life. And what I think Uber did very adroitly at Best Buy was he said, look, let me understand the job. And then I'm going to work backward and design my business model around that job. And a few things that he identified were, he said, wait a minute, if space on my showroom floor has value to a manufacturer, right? Well, they're going to help to pay for that space. <laughs> and so they started to have the stores within the stores, the Microsoft store and the Apple store and so forth. And, you know, people pay to have their products shown there. Uh, another thing he did was the whole uh, geek squad. He said, you know, people don't just buy a piece of technology. The job they want to get done is they want it to be installed and have it work and have the pleasure of using it. And that's where buyers have an incredible amount of frustration and angst. So he bought this company called the Geek Squad. Um, and that has now extended to creating a whole layer of customer relationship. Um, so, for example, they've got these people who will actually come to your home and do an assessment of all your tech. They're not on commission. Their, their job is to give you an objective assessment of how everything works and if they would make a recommendation what you kind of need and i've been very impressed with them they're not trying to sell you anything they're they're just there to be a trusted expert and so for an awful lot of people right that whole queasy feeling you have about going into a retail establishment and like it's going to be like a used car experience and they're going to try to sell me something i don't need that's just been completely evaporated so he's really redesigned that whole franchise around the customer experience and it's been very successful for them it's a great uh, it's a great example I, I, I want to follow up on on both parts of the conversation one you know you correctly pointed out uh, my obsession you know with business model design and business model innovation uh, in fact the way you and I got introduced to each other was from a mutual friend Alexander Osterwalder uh, who's quite well known uh, for that uh, I share his passion for it uh, check up check my thinking on this right so uh, my bias about thinking at the business model level, right? Because I see so many leaders that think innovation is down at what I'll call the point solution, a better product or mousetrap, a better capability that can then help the current business model perform better. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of innovation. It goes back to our share taking, you know, continue to improve the position of today's model. But that doesn't get you to an entire new business model, 
right? And so that's why, you know, Alex and I, we think at the business model design level and we talk about this notion of R&D for new business models, exploring entire new business models where you could literally experiment and prototype a business model, a minimum viable business model, not just a minimum viable product or, or technology. What's your reaction to that thinking about the frame of business model as a way to open up that transformation conversation? Oh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, absolutely. Particularly when you overlay the digital transformation on top of that. Um, so my friend Ryan McManus, my colleague, uh, we and he and I work together a lot. He has a great way of thinking about this. He calls it the past, present and future of digital transformation. I mean, and his thesis is, you know, when digital first started being a thing, right, um, it started where digitization was easy. So it started with books and music and movies. Um, and at that time, most established companies said, all right, digital is a marketing thing. And so the chief digital officer reported up to the chief marketing officer. And with a few exceptions, meaning the industries that were directly affected, the rest of us just kind of went, yeah, digital, great. Okay. Then the next wave was we started to see digital infuse itself into products and services. And so you started to see two-way communications between consumers and providers. Uh, so, for example, the, the consumer review would be a great example of this. I mean, you can't buy a hammer on Amazon without reading that somebody said, oh, you know, I left it out in the sun and then that plastic handle melted or whatever, you know, things no producer would ever think of, right? And then what we started to see was digital now creeping its way into actual business models because it changes the costs and it changes the, the operations of how a company's business model can work. Um, so I think it's entirely possible and useful to experiment with different business models. So a great example of this is a company called Buffer. Uh, and what Buffer is, is it's a utility which allows you to load up a bunch of communications, say tweets, um, at one point in the day, and it'll just send them out into the world spaced, you know, spaced evenly. And it was born because the founder, a guy named Joel Gassion, had this problem. He's a computer designer. And so for him to break off from his work and tweet, was just an interruptive kind of thing. And he was really looking for a solution to do it more broadly. Now he could have leapt in and raised a bunch of venture capital and you know, launched the business. Um, but what he did instead was he just put up two simple web pages. And the first one asked, would you like to tweet more consistently? Do that with Buffer. And you click on, a, on yes. And it takes you to a second web page, which says, oh, you caught us before we were ready. Give us your email address and we'll keep you informed of what we're doing. Um, and so that's an example of experimenting with a business model concept without having to build the whole thing at great expense. I love that. And it, 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 I think it's really important here because the same technology set that's available, and it's a pretty exciting time right now. You'd, I think we'd all agree that there's a lot of new emerging technologies in our sandbox you know, to explore and play with. The same technology can be used in an incremental way in the constraints of the current business model, and should be. But that same exact technology could be the nucleus of an entire new business model if you give yourself the freedom to do it. Uh, and uh, I, I think a lot of leaders still struggle with the both and here, right? That, that it's, not a, it, it's not a one size fits all in terms of how we use these technologies. And there's a big difference between improvement of today's model and opening up the horizon you know, for entire new models. Let's, let's finish our conversation, Rita. I, you know, I can't resist uh, talking with you wearing your business school professor hat. Uh, and you know, we all uh, you know have been reading and following you know some of the challenges that uh, the nation's business schools are having. Uh, even the most prestigious of them, right, have to be seeing these signs. You know, on the board. tell us what's happening in trying to to educate the future business leaders uh, in a world, as you so beautifully described uh, in our discussion today, is completely different than the one that, uh, that the business school professors I had, uh, I'm afraid to admit how long ago, um, yeah, taught me how to be a good share taker. Right. So a couple of things, and I'll go with the curriculum and then some of the other things the business degree has come to mean. So it's very clear that 
we really need to rethink what's in the curriculum of an MBA. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say Columbia has a new dean who doesn't come up through the traditional business background path. Uh, he actually comes from engineering and he comes from data and analytics. And one of his reasons for accepting the job, he's a longtime faculty member with Columbia, was to actually infuse our curriculum with more of that sensibility so that our MBAs will learn about tech, they'll learn about engineering, they'll learn about working with teams that have these multiple uh, functional ex areas of expertise. So I think there's a whole curricular thing. At the level of the MBA itself, you know, it used to be a differentiating degree. There was a huge amount of entry into it. You know, everybody and their brother had to have a B school. Um, and what we're seeing now is in the middle tiers of that set of offerings, it's not a differentiated degree anymore. And so a lot of people are saying, I'm not gonna give up two years and pay all that money and not see a real bump in my career or my salary or my opportunities. So a lot of the mid-tier schools are really scrambling. Um, and they're trying, you know, they're trying innovative solutions. So many are partnering with companies. They're trying things like, um, um, you know, one year more specialized degrees rather than the MBA. So you might get a, um, a one year certificate in digital design, you know, that kind of thing. So I think we're going to see an awful lot of, of pain. Um, because if you think about it, the, the, the professors you had, right? They weren't think, they were coming to work every day and thinking about how do I make this the most cutting edge up to date student experience. They were coming to work every day thinking, how do I write the best possible, most prestigious research articles that I can? Because that's where the incentives are, right? So I think we're going to see a massive reckoning with that structure of incentives in the business school that people are now going to say, wait a minute, it's not enough to write an article in an academic journal that gets read by six people. We really need our faculty out there in the real world making sense of it for our students. I think we're going to see a huge pressure on schools to do that, which you know, it's a little bit like the incentive problem we were talking about before that, you know, this is a completely different way of thinking about what an academic career is all about. Yeah, it, it, it needs to happen faster. I'm pretty sure Columbia and schools in its peer group you know, are going to be OK. Uh, but I think we're going to see a lot of business schools close um, you know, f for all the reasons that you're talking about. Let's finish up here. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me in the Business Model Sandbox. Let me uh, make a pitch uh, to our audience for your new book and uh, have you uh, uh, give us a uh, uh, the top line of why we should uh, run out and buy it. Her, uh, Rita's new book, Seeing Around Corners, Spotting Inflection Points Before They Happen. I mean, talk about a superpower we need in you know, today's turbulent times and exactly extends the conversation uh, that we've had here today. Uh, uh, Rita, you, I'm, I take it you're excited about the new book. I know you're on a book tour right now. I am. It's been it's been uh, global all over the place, multiple cities. It's kind of where am I now? Um, it's been great. So the book is about how do you see them? How do you see these inflection points coming? What are some practical techniques you can do that, including leaving behind this this blinders of your industry? Then the next part of it is how do you decide what to do about them? And here's where I really do advocate a discovery driven approach to figuring this out, because, you know, you don't want to make a big giant leap before you've got more data, you know, before you've got more information about which way the thing is actually going to play out. And the last part of the book talks about how you actually bring the organization with you. So you know, how do you get those people that are so steeped in the share taking old way of doing things to recognize that there's a really highly exciting new way to do things and how do you bring them along well rita good luck with the with the latest book i'm sure it's uh, it's going to do fantastic i would run not walk uh to whether it's the bookstore or or the virtual bookstore uh, uh get this book and 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 check out uh the other things that uh, rita has written uh wonderful i think you truly are a guru uh in the space we're, <laughs> we're fortunate uh to have you push our thinking and rita great to be with you today in the business thank you so much it's been a pleasure thank you <laughs>